This is Reverend Kirk Lawton, minister at Ocean Lakes Family Campground, and this is our podcast. Our prayer is that this message may enrich your life as you find God especially meaningful to you. Thank you for worshiping with us. We are looking at a lonely stretch of land in the midst of a desert area. There are no paved roads, but there is a suggestion of a trail which has been traveled before. On either side of this trail, there is nothing but bare sand with occasional clumps of weeds growing here and there. Everywhere we look, we can see small rocks dotting the landscape. Toward the west, The sun has already sunk below the horizon, and to the east, the mountains off in the distance have a growing darkness. It is obvious that night is not far away. As we look more closely, we can see the image of a man walking down this trail all alone. He's a rather young man. He walks with determination, but as he draws nearer, We can see in his face the look of fear, dejection, perhaps guilt. The closer we look at him, the more it is obvious that he's beginning to grow rather tired. He must have been walking for some time. Now and then he looks back over his shoulder as if to see if anybody is following him. It's no wonder this fellow has cheated his old father and has defrauded his brother out of the family blessing, and now he's had to run for his life because he knows that his angry brother is hot on his heels. This is a man who has been driven out. Sin always drives a person out. It drove Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. It drove the prodigal son out of his father's house. It drove Peter out into the night where he wept bitterly. It drove Judas out into the night where he took his own life. And it drove this young man out from his father's house and from his father's country. Yes, sin always drives a person out, away from loved ones, away from God. This solitary traveler stops walking now and he selects a place at the side of a small hill where he can be somewhat protected from the evening wind. He removes the leather straps from around his shoulder, which hold his pouch, in which he has a few simple belongings, and he places this on the ground beside him. On the top of this, he lays his staff, which he's been carrying. Spying a rather large rounded stone over to one side, He wearily tugs at this stone until he positioned it just exactly where he wants it. Then, placing his head on this smooth oval stone, he wraps his garment around him, even covering his face, and sinks into a deep sleep to relieve his exhaustion. But his sleep is not all peaceful. Maybe it is because he has such guilt feelings. Is it because he knows he may be found by his revenge-seeking brother? Whatever the reason, he begins to dream. And oh, what a dream it is. It is one of the most beautiful of all the dreams ever recorded in the Bible. In his dream, he saw a ladder or a staircase set up which reached from right where he was all the way up to heaven. The angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And at the top of the ladder stands the Lord himself. This young man listens very closely. And he hears God speaking to him, telling him that this is the God of his father and the God of his grandfather. He says that the whole land on which this young man is lying, plus the whole country, north, south, east, and west, would someday belong to him and to his descendants. He heard God promise that in his seed would all the families of the earth be blessed. 
Then came the most beautiful part of God's promise, that God would be with him in all places wherever he went and would one day bring him back safely to his own homeland. When this young man awoke after that beautiful dream, he thought to himself, surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Like Moses, this young man now realized that he truly was on holy ground. He was so thrilled because of this encounter with God until he decided to mark that spot in some special way. So he took the stone which he had rested his head on, set it upright, and poured some oil on it. Then, bowing down before this stone in an attitude of prayer for reverence, he made a promise to God. He promised that if God would keep him and be with him and bring him again to his father's house in peace, then he would follow the Lord as his God and would someday come again to that very spot and worship God again. Now by this time, the sky was beginning to become a bit brighter over the mountains to the east, and it was beginning to be a new day. Taking up his staff, putting his arm into the leather straps, holding his pouch of belongings, this young man starts walking out again, heading toward the northeast. As he walks, refreshed from the night's sleep, he looks back over his shoulder again, this time not to see if someone is following him, but to get one more glimpse of that special place where he had dreamed that marvelous dream of the ladder, the angels, and God. As we watch him, gradually his figure grows smaller and dimmer until finally Jacob is out of sight on his way to Haran. This is a story which many of us learned many years ago. But what happened after Jacob left this place which he called Bethel, the house of God? Well, he went on to Mesopotamia, to Haran, and found his mother's brother, Laban. There he began climbing another ladder, the ladder of success. Jacob was one who was willing to work, not only for his uncle Laban, but also for the right to marry the woman whom he loved, Rachel. You remember how he worked for seven long years for Rachel, but then old crafty Uncle Laban substituted Rachel's older sister, Leah, instead. So Jacob had to work another seven years to get the one whom he originally wanted to marry. I think that must be where we get our phrase, look before you leap. Anyway, during all these years, Jacob continued to prosper. He became rich and powerful and successful. But in the midst of all his prosperity, Jacob was reminded by God that he had vowed a vow to return to his native land. And so after many years, Jacob did return to his homeland. He went back to Bethel, offered to God his sacrifice, and worshiped God again there. That's the story. Now, let's spend these few remaining moments as we draw some lessons from this beautiful story from the Bible. There are many other details that we could look at, but I want us to get on to the heart of the issue and take with us some conclusions that might help us in our daily lives. The first is this. Jacob found God where he did not expect to find him. After all, who would ever think of having an encounter with God out in the middle of the desert? I think it was harder for Jacob to conceive of this than it would be for us today. Back in biblical times, people thought that God was confined to certain places, such as the temple in Jerusalem or some special holy place. That, that idea is not quite so prevalent today. In fact, we don't have to go very far to hear somebody say, why, I can worship God just as well somewhere else as I can in a church building. How many golfers do you know whose primary purpose on the golf course is to worship God? 
probably the closest they get to it is if they make a bad shot and they yell out the profanity, oh my God. Uh, worship God better on the beach? Yeah, some say that. And I'm sure that's probably true, especially when young girls in a bikini or a thong walk by. I guess it may cause that same expression that golfers have with a different meaning. Oh my God. Well, Jacob had no idea that night when he put his head on that stone that he would see God during the night. But he found that this place was the house of God. And that's why Jacob named that place Bethel, Bethel, literally house of God. A rather interesting observation on this is the fact that the Bible says that angels were ascending and descending on the ladder. Note that it does not say the angels were descending and then ascending. Their place of origin was on the earth, not heaven. The angels were right there with him all the time. Jacob was right there in the house of God. There's another observation we can see on, in this story. Jacob tried to bargain with God. I think we can all well identify with Jacob in his attempt to make a deal with God. We might think of how wonderful it is that Jacob would make his vows to God here at this spot. But we see the real character of this man in his attempt to bargain with God. Remember, God had already told Jacob how he was going to bless him. God had already shown his hand. He had nothing to hide from Jacob. But Jacob, instead of responding to God's goodness with a loving and a trustful heart, tries to make sure that he'll give away nothing until he first gets everything that he wants. God has made promises to Jacob which reveal a bountiful outpouring of divine blessings. And how does Jacob respond to all that? Well, listen, it's recorded in Genesis chapter 28. Jacob says, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, I will, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set up for a pillow shall be God's house. And all that thou givest me, I will give a tenth to thee. Wow, Jacob, God did not want Jacob's sacred pillar, even his tithes, so much as he wanted Jacob. Many times in our lives, the God we want is not like the God who wants us. Look at a third truth from this story. Back to Bethel, required preparation. It meant more than just gathering up his family, his flocks, his possessions. Jacob knew that if he was to return to a sacred spot where many years ago he had met God, he would first have to go through a cleansing, a purifying process. And so Jacob orders his household and all his people to give him their idols and superstitious objects so that he may bury them Anything belonging to a strange God would not be acceptable at the holy place of the God of Israel. Let me read a brief passage about this and notice, if you will, how God also protected Jacob in the journey back to him. This is from Genesis chapter 35, the first seven verses. God spoke to Jacob, Go back to Bethel, stay there and build an altar to the God who revealed himself to you when you were running for your life from your brother Esau. Jacob told his family and all those who lived with him, throw out all the alien gods which you have, take a good bath, and put on clean clothes. We are going to Bethel. I'm going to build an altar there to the God who answered me when I was in trouble and has stuck with me everywhere I've gone since. They turned over to Jacob all the alien gods they'd been holding on to, along with their lucky charm earrings. Jacob buried them under the oak tree at Shechem. Then they set out. A paralyzing fear descended on all the surrounding villages so that they were unable to pursue the sons of Jacob. 
Jacob and his company arrived at Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. He built an altar there and named it El Bethel, God of Bethel, because that's where God revealed himself to him when he was running from his brother. That's Genesis 35, the first seven verses. And so Jacob erected here a new altar. He called it El Bethel. Bethel means house of God. And El Bethel means the God of the house of God. Before when, before when Jacob had seen the staircase and the angels and God in his dream, Jacob had been concerned about the place. Now, upon his return to Bethel, a person had become more important. God. Some 30 years before, Jacob had first met God at this place, and now it was time for renewal. Jacob was not beginning a new relationship. He was renewing an old relationship. Another truth in this story is that Jesus Christ is our ladder to God. I think the most beautiful of all the applications we can make in this story is that we as Christians have a ladder which connects us to God, just as Jacob had a connecting ladder. I think it's not twisting the Bible at all to say that Jesus is our ladder. Turn with me to John's Gospel, the first chapter. Toward the end of that chapter, we see Jesus in conversation with Nathaniel whom Jesus called the Israelite in whom is no guile. That's verse 47. Now, look at the last verse in that chapter, verse 51. Jesus picked up on that same story, and he saw in his work and mission on earth that he, Jesus, was a ladder also, a connector between God the Father and mankind. Let me read from the King James. John chapter 1, verse 51. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven opened, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Yes, Jesus Christ is the true ladder between God and man. Because God became man and lived among us in Christ, we now have direct access through Jesus to the Father. The author of Hebrews reflected this same truth when he wrote in the fourth chapter of Hebrews, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with a feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So many of our most beautiful hymns that we sing have fallen into disuse because of their association with funerals. Robert Plummer and his wife once attended the funeral of a fine Christian man. In keeping with his respect, it was a time of celebration of the victory which was his in Christ. In their car on the way home from the funeral, Plummer and his wife began talking about the songs they would like to have used at their funerals. The wife started humming a song which she liked very much, she said that that was a song she wanted used at her service. She couldn't think of the title, however. She did know that it was a hymn of praise of God, and that's what she wanted. But she did remember the first line of the song, which she told her husband, and, and then he began to laugh. The first line went like this, We praise thee, O God, for the son of thy love. <coughs> he said, Dear, is that really the song you want used at your funeral? Yes. She said, do you know what the title is? The husband said, well, I'm not too sure you want that hymn used at your funeral. The title of that hymn is Revive Us Again. <laughs> a 
Bethel was a place of revival for Jacob, not so much because of the place, but as he came back, it was because of the God of that place. Today, we've gathered here in a place that is holy. It's a recreation building throughout the week here at Ocean Lakes, but it's a holy place on Sunday, not because we're here, but because God is here. Yes, we are standing on holy ground as we sang at the first of this service. Maybe this is a place right now where you want to meet God anew. You've already met him before, but you want to renew your vows to him, even as Jacob did. This is your opportunity right now. It may be that you're not here with us. You're listening by podcast to this service today. Wherever you are, God is there with you right now. If you're able to do so, can you take just a moment and tell God in your own silent prayer whatever's in your heart to tell him? Tell him you want to come back to Bethel. Come back to God if you've wandered away. And if you've never known the Lord Jesus as your own Savior, this is the perfect time for that wonderful first encounter. Oh God, thank you so much that we have a God who is with us and who invites us to come. Your invitation is one of love, not of condemnation. We've all gone astray, but you're ready to receive us and we thank you for that. Lord, thank you for Jesus, our latter to you. In his name we pray. Amen.